Mr. Hefner again. And today we are going to take a look at a work by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Now, Hawthorne is one of those American authors we credit along with Edgar Allan Poe and Washington Irving as being the creators of the short story. In, in Europe, they were, they were binding and, and publishing and buying and reading uh, books. They were write, reading novels. In America, we could buy expensive novels, but the print presses that we had here weren't quite of the quality that they were in Europe and people didn't have the money for them, but they still wanted to read. We had a very high literacy rate in the early days of America. And uh, so writers started publishing short works in literary magazines that they could copy and, and uh, sell. Uh, and, and you could buy one for yourself and then pass it to somebody else and pass it to somebody else. Uh, as we talked about, it wasn't a way to make a whole lot of money because once you sold the short story, you had received all the money you were going to get. You didn't get royalties back in those days. But Nathaniel Hawthorne was one of those authors who uh, felt like he had something to say. And uh, as we go into today's presentation to get ready for reading Rappuccini's Daughter, which takes place in a garden, which is why I'm in a garden here today. Uh, once we get started, we'll talk about what his motivations might have been and what makes up his style. So there's no better time than right now to get started. Now, the title of today's short story, and it's a long short story, but it still counts as a short story because it falls under 3,000 words, is Rappuccini's Daughter. This is a story that takes place in Italy, but it has, uh, how can I say, it's, it, it, it's pure Hawthorne in that the influences that he applies to this story, which he chooses to set in Italy, actually come from his experiences in Massachusetts. So it's, it's an American short story set in Italy with American influences, if that makes sense. Our lesson essential question is going to be what characteristics of this story, Rappuccini's Daughter, uh, help show us Hawthorne's style. Now, we'll do this a little differently today because to determine an author's style, you really need to read a number of pieces by that author. And we're only going to be reading this one, Rappuccini's Daughter. So as we go through today's presentation, I'll talk to you about what we see as elements of, of style. And then as you read the story, I'll ask you to look for those elements of his style. Now, here's our uh, kind of, if we were doing a journal, this comes from our textbook. Here's the think about question. How can you tell whether a friend is a bad influence or someone you can trust? And, you know, being in high school, I'm sure you, most people anyway, so I'm, I'm assuming uh, that you have had a friend at some point that you trusted that maybe your parents didn't want you to trust or your parents didn't trust. Maybe you trusted a friend that later on you learned was untrustworthy. So how do we really know these things? In this particular story, uh, we have a, a main character and uh, he's going to trust a number of people. Some are trustworthy, some are not. And sometimes he may, I don't wanna do any spoilers here, but he may be trusting the wrong ones. All right, so let's talk a little bit about Nathaniel Hawthorne. So he's in the New England Renaissance, 1800 to 1860 for this particular unit. And so he was alive to have his photograph taken as well. In our last unit, we had no photographs. Now we've got some photographs of some of these authors. So with Hawthorne, uh, he lived until 1864. So he's going to live uh, up through most of the American Civil War and then die during that time. But what do we know about him? We know that he was born in Salem, Massachusetts. Now, you might remember the name Salem, Massachusetts, and associate that with some famous witch trials. And in fact, the witch trials which occurred there uh, were a great influence on him. He didn't live through them. They happened back in the 1600s, uh, but they're part of the, uh, the culture there. In fact, if you go to Salem, Massachusetts, it's a beautiful little town, but if you go there on vacation or to visit at some point, uh, you'll find that the witch trade still is part of their tourist trade up there. You can go in shops that sell things for witches. It's got kind of a witch theme. Uh, but Hawthorne uh, wrestled with this idea of how did something like that happen? How did people come to believe that their very neighbors were witches uh, and they were willing to give them these very unfair trials and then put them to death? And I don't have it on this slide, uh, but Hawthorne was also fascinated uh, with the way the Puritans of Massachusetts, and remember, Puritans are a religious, are a religious movement. Uh, they came to Massachusetts so that they could practice their religion without being persecuted, but then they had this habit of persecuting anyone who had a different re religion. They were not very tolerant of that. And when the Quakers, who were extremely tolerant of other religions, even though it was outside you know, their own beliefs, 
Um, when the Quakers moved into Massachusetts, uh, these, these Puritans persecuted and killed them as well. And Hawthorne became sort of fam fascinated and then he became a scholar. He spent several years studying the Puritans uh, and, and how they came to behave that the way that they did, losing the ability to speak here. He had a college education. Uh, he went to Bowdoin College in Maine. A number of very famous Americans went there. And, and to this day, Bowdoin is still in operation. It's considered a very elite college. Uh, he met Franklin Pierce while he was there. Franklin Pierce was later going to be president. And then when Pierce was president, he would offer some government jobs to Hawthorne. Remember, you couldn't just make a living being a writer. And so most writers did something else in those days. And he also met the poet uh, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And we're going to read some Longfellow poems uh, in this unit as well. And like I told you, he was a scholar who uh, uh, fat focused his energies on understanding or trying to make sense of uh, the Puritans and the crazy kinds of things that happened with them. Some of his other jobs, he, he was a customs house surveyor. Uh, it was a government position, American consul to England later in his life. Again, uh, that's a, a government position. He traveled throughout Europe. And, and when he died, he left a, a whole collection of unfinished work. And some of those are really interesting to read and some writers since then have taken it upon themselves uh, to write some good endings to those tales. His two most famous works, I, I would say these are his most famous works and you might recognize the titles are The Scarlet Letter. And The Scarlet Letter is a tale of, of Puritans again, trying to seek out evil in the world. And, and they accuse a woman of adultery and she must wear a, a, a scarlet, a red A, uh, on her clothing at all the time to identify herself to everyone else as this sinner. Uh, and the story looks at the idea of, you know, when we persecute others for their wrongs, uh, are we helping them or are we making it worse? And then the House of the Seven Gables is, is another one of the, uh, uh, the famous ones. Now, a uh, couple quick things about him. Uh, I think I've covered a lot of this before. It's just kind of interesting. In 1842, uh, he moves into uh, one of the former homes of, uh, Emerson, and we're going to read Emerson in this unit as well. Uh, and Emerson's houses are, are kind of interesting. Uh, but anyway, that's in Concord, Massachusetts. I'll show you the picture of that later on. I already uh, mentioned some of the short stories that he uh, published. But I do, wanna, I, I do wanna touch on a few things about his style. And uh, right here, let me circle those for you. So in works by Hawthorne, we're gonna look for symbols. So remember again, a symbol is something that in literature stands for itself and something else. So a bell is still a bell, but that bell might be symbolizing the idea of freedom, right? Uh, the other thing about his stories, this is gonna be true for Hawthorne and it's gonna be true for Edgar Allan Poe as well. Their stories are incredibly psychological. They seem to understand what's going on deep in the human mind, you know? and. Remember, the field of psychology doesn't even exist at this time, so it's not like they studied it. These are two authors who have studied people, and they've come to a, uh, their own perceptions of the inner workings of, of the brain and, and sometimes the darker side uh, of the human spirit. And then the last thing there is, is he's preoccupied. Preoccupied means like an idea just takes hold of you and it, and it won't let go. And throughout his life, Hawthorne is preoccupied with those Puritans. Again, they came from Europe because they wanted to practice their own religion. Then they became intolerant of anybody with uh, a different religion. People were accused of being witches. They were tested, they were tried, they were executed. By the way, in America, no witches were ever burned at the stake. The, the witches were hanged. They had rope around the neck and drop them and, and that was it. But. Um, but anyway, this idea that here are people who claim to be um, people of God and their whole mission in life is to seek out evil in the world and destroy it. And in, in their crazy attempts to find all the evil they can and wipe it from the earth, they actually are the source of evil. And you're gonna find this uh, in probably most, I would say most, I, I'm comfortable with that. <laughs> it's most of Hawthorne's works. Now we talked about a symbol. It's, it's symbols stand for themselves and something else. And so Hawthorne is full of these symbols and particularly, particularly look for symbols uh, of good and evil. Because I think a lot of people just see that good and evil are, are two opposite things. But as Hawthorne realizes, 
what we think is good can be evil sometimes and what we think is evil could actually be good. And the lines aren't always all that clear between the two. And we've talked about illusions before. So illusions occur when writers make references to things that readers should already know. And in a lot of cases, it's going to be references to the classics. So many, many kind of highbrow writers will make references to the literature of the Greeks and the Romans because people studied these things in school. And anyone who went to a university uh, learned to read and write uh, either Latin or sometimes Greek. And it wasn't modern Greek, it was Hellenic Greek. It was the language of Homer. And so uh, because this was a part of their culture, they sort of assumed as a lot of people do when we, when we know something, we assume other people know it too. And that may not always be the case, but these writers often put these allusions to the classics in their literature. So we're gonna look for that too, as we go through here. And now this is the first work, uh, you know, uh, Rappuccini's daughter that we're gonna be reading today. That is a fantasy. So if you go all the way back to ninth grade, uh, you probably did a, a folklore unit. And in that folklore unit, uh, you may have read some fairy tales. Fairy tales are fantasies. Uh, they include uh, exaggerations, unrealistic elements. Sometimes they include things like magic or magical spirits or something like that. Uh, you're going to look for those kinds of things in this story. Because on the surface, it seems like a very realistic story. But we're going to have these elements of something almost magical going on in the story. So keep your eyes open for those. Uh, you have to remember that old term, suspension of disbelief. You may have to suspend your disbelief uh, in order to enjoy this story. Now, as you read the story, uh, these are the things I want you to look for. Look for those elements of style. Look for the symbols. Look for the illusions. Look for this idea of good and evil aren't always easily distinguished. Look for the idea of those preoccupied with rooting out evil in the world and sometimes going too far uh, to take care of it and, and, and eradicate it. Um, look for um, elements of fantasy. Much of the story seems like science. And yet at some points you're going to say, well, that sounds more like magic than science. So look for those as well. All right, now, if you're watching this video and you're going to be working remotely, this is the point where you want to stop the video and go read the story and then come back to the video and we'll go over the checking for understanding questions, All right? There's no way I can make you do that. And if you want to read the checking for understanding questions and get all the free answers first, go right ahead. But I can't promise there won't be spoilers. All right, so let's take a look at these. All right, so the first ones that we have are some fill-ins here. And uh, we have some words like romantic, fantasy, uh, symbol, illusion, and short story. Number one says, writers of the blank period believed in the value of private subjective experiences, including human emotions and the creative imagination. And this was a period of time called the Romantic period. Uh, it was just the idea in this Romantic period that there's more to the world than just the, the physical, that there might be some spiritual stuff, that there, there are some energies in the world that connect ideas. Think of Star Wars, right? If you've ever seen any Star Wars movies, uh, there's always the science in, the, in, in Star Wars, you know, with the weapons and the spaceships. But then there's also this uh, almost like mystical religious belief in this thing called the force. So ideas like that come out of this romantic period. What includes literary works that feature highly unrealistic elements? And I told you, Rappuccini's Daughter is one of these. Right? That would be a fantasy, right? Pretty simple. And then many literary... Many literary art works include these, or rhetorical elements that make a reference to a person, event, object, uh, or uh, something from history. And symbol might work there, you could put, but because of the idea that it says, or a work from history or literature, uh, the better answer for that would be illusions. Again, references to things in the story uh, that your reader should already understand. If your reader doesn't understand it, the illusion doesn't work. And then some multiple choices. In the story, Giovanni is our, our main character, our protagonist. What does Giovanni's landlady say Rappuccini does with his plants? I mentioned I'm standing in a garden for a reason today. And the landlady says that he makes medicines out of them. Now, this idea of medicine in a fantasy is kind of an interesting thing. Again, if you can remember all the way back to ninth grade when you read Romeo and Juliet with your teacher, uh, you remember Friar Lawrence, the one who kind of messed up everything for Romeo and Juliet. He was into plants and herbs and, and making distilled liquors from them. And at one point in the play, he does a, a soliloquy about uh, how 
in this plant, there are certain medicines, but there's also poisons. They live together in the same plant. And there's often this idea, again, good and evil, not being clear, medicines and poisons. Most medicines could be poisons if they're taken improperly. And, and think of things like a botulism toxin, one of the most deadly toxins we know of, but it's used as a medicine to, in, in many ways today uh, to treat people. Botox, if you've ever heard of that, that is botulism toxin that's literally injected into people to deaden some nerves to get rid of wrinkles. What does Beatrice, now Beatrice is uh, the love interest of Giovanni in the story. What does Beatrice call the magnificent purple flower that is growing in the garden? Heart's desire, sister, devil weed, or queen? Somehow I think devil weed would be interesting, but she calls it sister. And the first time you hear that, it's a little weird. If you see a young girl going over to a plant, she says, how are you today, sister? Sounding like a fantasy yet? I think it's a fantasy. All right, what causes Baglioni? I say Baglioni. Uh, the Italian pronunciation is not Baglioni, but I don't speak Italian, so we're going to stay with Baglioni. Uh, what causes him to worry after he runs into Giovanni on the street? Now, Baglioni is one of the professors at the college, along with Rappuccini. Baglioni doesn't trust Rappuccini, and he, warn, he warns Giovanni about him. Okay, so what does he fear? Yeah, he fears that Rappuccini has turned Giovanni into the subject of one of his experiments. And again, science, is science good or is science evil? Well, we like to think of science as trying to do good, but there's always that idea of the experiment that is unethical, the experiment that goes too far. Why does Giovanni speak harshly to Beatrice in, in their last visit in the garden? Now, this is the resolution of the story. So if you haven't read it, we're about to ruin everything for you. Why does he speak harshly to her? Yeah, he believes he's been poisoned and he believes that she did it and that she did it on purpose, that she knew what was going on. In reality, she didn't. Rappuccini was the mastermind behind what was going on, not his poor innocent daughter. Now there's a line at the uh, end of the story, you know, was this garden then the Eden of the present world? And that illustrates this concept of illusion, right? Because if you don't understand that uh, from the Judeo-Christian tradition, there was the art, uh, the, the garden of uh, Adam, Eve, the, the garden of Eden, Adam and Eve were there. Uh, they had everything they wanted. The world was perfect. They were just told, don't do this one thing. And evil sneaks in and convinces them to do something different. And they end up ruining you know, everything for everybody. This is a common theme uh, in, in mythology. If, if you go all the way back to the legend, the Greek legend of, of Pandora's box, everything was perfect in the world. And Pandora was given this box and told never, ever, ever open it. And her curiosity got the best of her. When she opened it, all of the evils that are now in the world escaped and they got out. If it hadn't been for that, if Pandora hadn't opened that box, uh, everything would be fine in the world today. It makes me wonder why anybody wants to go to a jewelry store named Pandora and buy anything, but that's, that's another story. Which character in the story is described as tall, emaciated, sallow, and sickly looking? A face singularly marked with intellect and cultivation but which could never have expressed much warmth of heart. This is a description of like a, a, a scientist with a bad bedside manager, manner. Uh, thin, doesn't eat, hungry, very intelligent, but sometimes intelligent people uh, work from their brain and they're unable to work from their heart. So in this particular case, that is Rappuccini. He's not our protagonist, right? Giovanni is our protagonist but the story is named for Rappuccini because he's probably the most interesting character in the story. Now, uh, one of the ideas in this story is the idea of, of love. You know, when do you know it's real? When can you trust it in someone else? And so only one character in this story actually does feel true love, and that would be Beatrice. And in Italian, they say Beatrice. I've heard somebody say that, I say Beatrice. Um, she uh, ends up dying for the one that she loves because the one that she loves didn't trust her and accused her. So she's the only one that can actually feel true love. How does Baglioni contribute to the end of this story? What does he do at the end of this? 
All right. He gives Giovanni an antidote to the poison. So he believes Giovanni's been poisoned. He makes an antidote, gives it to Giovanni to take. But by the end of the story, Beatrice drinks it instead. And because she was raised with the poison, it's not anything new, she can't live without it. And so taking the antidote, which would have perhaps saved Giovanni, ends up killing Beatrice. And, and that's the answer to our last question. What is Beatrice's final gift to Giovanni? It's a gift of love. He didn't trust her. He, you know, he believed she poisoned him. And so she tries to save him by drinking the poison, uh, by drinking the antidote, because she knows that once you've been introduced to the poison, this is getting complicated, but the poison that Rappuccini made, this antidote would actually kill you. And she's the one who dies for the one she loves. All right, so I hope you read Rappuccini's Daughter and I hope you enjoyed it. At some point, I'm going to show you a, uh, uh, an old 1970s short film adaptation of the story. They've changed a few things because a few things are, are difficult to take to film. So it's, you're responsible for the written version. You are responsible for Hawthorne, not for the CBS adaptation, but it's still a good version to see and I'll be glad to show it to you. The garden that I'm in, by the way, today here, uh, it is, it, it's a beautiful garden. It is not Italian, it's not Rappuccini's. It was the best garden I could find. Uh, but this is actually at the Cloister Museum in New York City. This building uh, behind me here was actually a, an old monastery from the Middle Ages in Europe. It was taken apart stone by stone, brought to the Americas and, and reassembled. And it's now uh, part of the uh, Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. If you ever get up there, uh, it's uh, north of Harlem, kind of not too far off the uh, George Washington Bridge. Uh, be sure to check it out. It's, it's worth spending an afternoon there sometime. All right, again, thank you if you stayed with me through the whole presentation and I'll see you in class.